Hi, Dr. Shalfin. Hi, how are you doing? I'm good. I hope you are too. Uh, you know, obviously a, a difficult question to answer in these months and so, uh, but we do what we have to do. So um, let me first welcome you to our conference. I mean, we're super glad you're here. Oh, well, thank you so much for having me. It's absolutely my pleasure. Okay. Can you tell us um, what kind of doctor you are and where you practice? Sure. So I am currently a urologic oncology fellow at the National Institutes of Health. And I was fortunate enough to come here after doing my urology surgery training in residency at Hopkins. And so now I'm completing an additional fellowship specifically focusing on urologic oncology, prostate, bladder, kidney cancer, et cetera. And National Institutes of Health sounds more like a bureaucracy than a hospital. Can you sort of describe what it actually physically is? Sure. So many people don't realize that we actually have a 200 bed hospital on the National Institutes of Health campus in Bethesda. And it's a very special place because they've done a lot of first in human. And I feel incredibly fortunate to be uh, in the world of prostate cancer that I'm speaking about today with Dr. Peter Pinto, who really pioneered the use of prostate MRI. And so all of his original research on that came out of what we have here at the National Institutes of Health and is now becoming standard of care uh, for men. So it's a wonderful place to be. And of course, Dr. Linehan in kidney cancer discovering the VHL gene and many others. So it's, it's really a fantastic opportunity for me to train here and I'm very grateful for that. Yeah, and we're, I mean, as a patient community, we're grateful that NIH exists. I mean, it's, it's you know, it's truly a national treasure, you know, and there's no way to sort of uh, downplay that. It's, it's a super place that uh, helps us all live longer and happier lives. So we're grateful and great to have your insights from that. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about the hospital experience that patients uh, undergoing surgery are uh, facing or going to experience. And um, uh, you have a, a presentation and I'd love to hear it and sh if you would share your screen and uh, let our audience in. Or not. Up oh, there and now we're back. Sorry about that. Ah, I just okay. froze, frozen briefly. Um, so NIH bandwidth, it really is. It's really a government sponsored bandwidth, isn't it? <laughs> no comment on that. <laughs> okay. All right, if, if you could uh, do your presentation, that'd be super. Wonderful. Let me share my screen. Are you able to see my slides? Yeah. So Very good. Then, uh, we're going to be talking about what I call the hospital experience for a prostatectomy. And as we just discussed, uh, my background, so I'll zoom past this, but I will mention. I feel so fortunate to have trained with really the great in the field, Dr. Patrick Walsh at Johns Hopkins, as well as Dr. Parton and Dr. Aloff. And much of what I'm gonna say is what I learned uh, during my time as a resident, uh, being exposed uh, to really their excellence in the field. And my personal research focus is in what we call the liquid biopsy, cancer circulating tumor cells and circulating tumor DNA, just so you know a little bit about me as we move through. So what happens the day before surgery and how do you prepare to come to the hospital for your surgery? Oftentimes your surgeon will ask you to take what's called a clear liquid diet. And the reason for that is the prostate actually lives in your body very close to the rectum where the stool comes out. And so there's always a theoretical risk as we remove the prostate that there may perchance be an injury to the rectum. This is incredibly rare, but as sort of an insurance policy, many surgeons will ask you to drink a liquid diet uh, similar to how you would prepare for a colonoscopy. And some will add on to that sort of an oral clean out like the magnesium citrate that you might use and plus or minus an actual enema through the rectum just to prepare you for that. So that's something that you would face the day before and the morning before surgery. Also, some surgeons will ask you to shower with a certain type of wash to really make sure that your skin is as bacteria free as possible in the morning of the surgery. And something I really want to stress is that what I want to share, I really hope that 
patients take ownership of what they can control during their hospital experience. And it really does have a big impact on your recovery. So you will have made it through the surgery. We will take care of that. And it's going to take seven to 10 days for the pathologist to slice and dice the prostate and give you your final results with which we'll base your treatment plan and your next steps. So we really want you to focus on what you can do and try to take your mind off of wondering what happened during the surgery and the next steps for your cancer care. So these efforts are really gonna make a big difference in your safety and your health. And so what do I mean by that? So there's several exercises that I would like all prostate cancer surgery patients to be able to do. And these exercises, you only need to focus on them while you're awake, while you're sleeping, just get your best rest as you can. And it may be difficult because the nurses will actually have to disturb you every four hours to check on your vital signs. And so what you should do when you're approaching these exercises while you're awake is actually space them out for the best effect. Many people will try and go ahead and I'll say, do this 10 times and they'll do it 10 times quickly, but you really wanna space it out so you continue to have the good effect of the exercises over the entire day. So the first exercise that I'd like to introduce is something we call foot flaps. And this is whenever you think of it, just go ahead and do your foot flaps. And what this means is imagine you're pressing the gas pedal on a car and just flap your feet up and down. And the point of this is it helps to prevent a blood clot in your legs so that your calf muscles are moving and the blood that's pooling in your legs isn't just sitting there ready to form a clot, but is circulating back through your body. And we also have some other approaches to prevent blood clots, one of which is what's called a heparin shot, which is a little shot of a little bit of a whiff of a blood thinner. So we're not completely putting you on a therapeutic level of blood thinner, but just a small, we call it prophylactic amount. And you'll get those shots most likely every eight hours while you're in the hospital. You also have what I like to call squeegee boots, which are uh, some boots that wrap around your ankles and your calves and constantly massage those muscles while you're laying in bed. And some people find them hot and itchy and annoying, but it is really important to keep those on while you're laying in bed. Uh, the next exercise that's also very important is actually coughing. And I like to see my patients give two big coughs per hour. And the purpose of this is it helps to open and clear the lungs, helps you to get the supplemental oxygen off and get back to how you walked in the door, a normal person that can breathe on room air, and helps to prevent a pneumonia from forming in the lungs. And again, this is something that's really important to space out because it keeps the lungs open for the most time period. A lot of people will avoid this exercise because as you can imagine, when you cough, it jostles your abdomen where the surgical site was, and that can be uncomfortable and painful. Um, we'll speak more about pain control later. But one thing you can do, a tip and trick, is to take an extra pillow, a bed pillow, and brace yourself on your abdomen so that when you cough, your abdomen is not so jostled. The next exercise is called an incentive spirometer. And this needs to be done 10 times an hour while you're awake. So this will be a little plastic handheld device that has a little straw and you suck into it. Many people are confused and think they need to try to blow into the device, but you actually suck in to open your lungs to use it. And again, this is the main thing you might think while you're watching TV, you want to do it every time a commercial turns on. You don't just want to stack the 10 at the beginning of the hour. And once you get to be pulling good volumes, because the spirometer goes up to about two liters, two and a half liters, and it'll tell you where you are along that, how much of a breath that you pulled in, then once you're hitting a good enough number, there's a second device on the side that confuses many people. And the purpose of that is to help you take a slow, even breath. So that's like the pro level, I tell my patients. First, get a good number, and then you're taking this home with you to use at home while you recover. The uh, next exercise that is the most important is walking. And I like to see from my patients four walks a day. This is the very best thing that you can do to get yourself home and to stay well and avoid complications. And that's because it has many simultaneous effects. You're opening your lungs to prevent a pneumonia. 
you're moving your legs to prevent a blood clot. And what we'll speak about in detail is that walking helps to wake up your bowels so that food can move through and you can pass gas again. It doesn't matter how many laps you go or how far you go and you walk. It's just important of how many times that you get up during the day. And again, I really want you to space these out. So to speak more about this, this is an image where you can see on the left, someone's normal small, small bowels and they're working to push through food and gas um, so that things continue to move forward. And unfortunately, when we do your surgery, when the bowels get exposed to air and our instruments and hands, they get confused. And instead of pushing along like this, they sort of spasm as you can see on the image of the right and get swollen and distended with gas. And so that's why you may notice that you feel some bloating and you're not passing gas or stool through your bottom. And the cure for this is walking. Um, next, talking a little bit about pain control. So your team's goal is gonna be for you to be comfortable. So what you can expect to face here is the bloating that I just mentioned and some minor pain, but you don't have to be afraid that you're gonna be in extreme or serious pain. That's incredibly rare and we don't expect or want that to happen. Some patients are well-educated and they've heard in the news or in other sources that when you take opiate or narcotic pills, there can be a small risk of habit forming or addiction. And so your average person might come into the hospital and be very afraid to use the oxycodone or the Dilaudid that we ask you to take uh, in your recovery. Um, and it is true that there is a small risk of habit forming or opiate addiction in taking these pills. So we will try to avoid them, uh, you know, finish using them quickly. If you don't need them, we don't suggest that you take them. But on the flip side, there is a real serious risk of blood clot, slowing down your bowels and pneumonia if you're just lying there in serious pain that's not addressed. And a lot of times I've come in the room and I've had my patient tell me just frigid and frozen and say, Dr. Chalfin, it doesn't hurt so long as I don't move my body. And that's a terrible situation to be in because you're putting yourself at risk for complications. So when you need these pain pills, we highly suggest that you use them. One way to minimize using these is to actually rely on Tylenol around the clock, which means every time, which is usually every four to six hours that it's due, go ahead and take that. And that will take a serious edge off any pain. Um, and the only caveat for that is if you have a liver issue, your doctor may explain that Tylenol is not good for you. The other things that we have are called Toradol, and then the oral version of that would be sort of an ibuprofen and Advil. These are great anti-inflammatory pain medications. And the only caveats to them is that if you have kidney problems, they may not be so good for you to take uh, if you have abnormal kidney function. And also they can be related to exacerbation of bleeding. So it's great to take Advil and ibuprofen once you're home and your urine is clear yellow and no longer red and with your doctor's permission, of course, but it's less nice to use those while you're still in the hospital where we would initially rely on Tylenol. Toradol is actually excellent in the hospital if you're meeting certain benchmarks in terms of your amount of blood in your urine, your blood number on your lab work and your kidney function. Um, so, and of course we have the opiates. And one thing that patients don't realize is that oftentimes you do receive opiates during the course of the surgery while you're under anesthesia anyway. So it's not like an all or nothing thing if you take one or two pills after the surgery. On the day of surgery, you'll be taken to the preoperative area and this is where you'll say uh, goodbye to your family and meet with the surgeon and the anesthesia team and sign your consent forms if you haven't already done that. And for you, you'll have a good rest and a good nap while we do our work. And the next thing that you'll know, it'll be the afternoon or evening after surgery. Um, and you'll initially recover in the recovery room and then be transferred to a regular floor. So my goals for you at this point would be if you can give me just one walk this afternoon or evening, 
that would be A plus fantastic. Now, I certainly understand that sometimes patients are too sleepy or tired or in, in pain and discomfort, and they can't make that first walk the night of surgery. And then I would advise them just to really focus on an early morning walk the next morning. But if you can, that's a really fabulous sign of your recovery. Of course, your walk has to be with your nurse. You'll have many new tubes and lines, and you don't want to feel faint with any, out anyone there. So it has to be with your nurse until they give you permission uh, to go alone. And then the other thing I'm looking for the night of surgery when I come to check you the next morning is that have you been able to stop using supplemental oxygen and gone on to breathing room air like how you did when you came in? That's a sign that you're on the right track and you're doing your exercises properly. So again, those exercises to focus on you may notice you have a sore throat that's expected. That's going to be minimal. That could be from the tube that was in place, your breathing tube during anesthesia. Another interesting thing to point out is that there's this phenomenon. This only applies to robotic surgery, not open surgery. But during robotic surgery, we fill the abdomen with carbon dioxide gas. And that causes an irritation of the diaphragm, which is the muscle that underlies the lungs and helps them to open and breathe. And for some reason, the wiring of the nervous system translates irritation of that nerve to the shoulders. And so a lot of patients will experience a brief shoulder pain. Again, not anything severe or debilitating, but something that could be surprising. And that actually may be more noticeable or worse when you get up to walk. And so now that you know, it wouldn't be a surprise and we would expect it to get better and go away over the next several days. And that night or afternoon after surgery, you will more than likely be on what's called the clear liquid diet again. Don't worry, you won't feel hungry at this point, uh, having gone through the surgery and you'll have some ice chips, jello and broth for that evening. Then what about the first day after surgery that we call post-operative day one? So again, the bloating is something you're gonna feel and it can actually be normal to take up to a week to pass gas or have a bowel movement after surgery. So what you should again focus on are your exercises, eat breakfast, and I'll talk more about what foods to eat. You'll probably be receiving some training on your urine catheter and we'll talk more about that coming up. And you may be getting some discharge teaching to prepare you to go home from nurses. And there may be a set video that the institution has for you to watch. I really would like you to consider using a suppository on this day. This is a small medicine that goes into the rectum. What I tell my patients is this is certainly not required because it is expected that you won't have a bowel movement or pass gas for up to a week. But what this can do is help speed things along and it can help relieve some of the gas in the rectum when the nurse places the suppository. So if you find that you're really tortured by the bloating feeling, you may wanna consider using that suppository while you're in the hospital the first day. And then of course, if you have a drain, a surgical drain um, that will likely be removed before you go home. And so I wanna say some more about a drain. So whether or not you have a drain after a prostatectomy probably has more to do with your surgeon than you or how your surgery went. There's a new trend towards not leaving a drain during prostatectomy, um, but in many cases or a more conservative person, they will choose to leave the drain. The purpose of the drain is to see if there is urine that is leaking from where the uh, bladder has been sewn back to the urethra and to leave that drain in place so that can heal over the catheter um, before the drain is removed. When the drain is actually removed, people tell me, because I, I asked my patients for their experience, that it simply just feels weird when it comes out for three or five seconds versus any severe or debilitating pain. So it's not something to be afraid of, just to know that you'll have a brief, strange sensation. While you have the drain in and after it's removed, you can notice some leaking of some thin fluid, either red or yellow around the site that will heal in the coming days. Some doctors will be checking the drain fluid with a lab work to see if it does contain urine and that's called a creatinine check. Um, 
other doctors may rely on the amount of fluid that's coming out. And if you do end up having a, a leak of urine, you might be sent home with the drain and be asked to keep a diary of how much is coming out over time. But ultimately we would expect that all drains uh, would come out. So what about you being discharged? What are the doctors looking for? So overwhelmingly patients after prostatectomy are discharged on the first day. Um, we are looking for you to meet certain benchmarks for that to be safe. And that is, if you can eat without feeling nauseous, without vomiting, if you can get up and walk without fainting or feeling dizzy, if you've managed to no longer need supplemental oxygen and can breathe with room air, and that your vital signs are normal. Very importantly, we look at the catheter and check how much urine you're making and the color of the urine, is it yellow, pink, or red? We check your blood work, including your infection number, your blood number, and your kidney function. And again, you don't necessarily need to pass gas for you to be sent home because we expect that over the coming week. So what do you do if you've gone home and you're not even uh, passing gas yet? What are you supposed to eat? So the morning after surgery, I highly recommend that you start off with a cream of wheat or an oatmeal, and that's what's called a full liquid diet for breakfast. And your doctor may keep you on that for lunch with a potato soup or a tomato soup or something like that, or they may transition you to a regular diet. But I really try to impress to my patients that when you're on a regular diet, I really want you to think of it as a common sense diet, because if nothing's coming out in terms of bowel movement or passing gas, you really don't want to continue to eat heavy or spicy foods. So I asked them to imagine as if you had the stomach flu, a stomach bug, what types of things you would eat on a sensitive stomach, like crackers, stews, plain rice, um, even, even chicken is okay, but it's not the time for you know, a T-bone steak or, or maybe a, any type of spicy food. So just really use common sense as you move forward during that time period. Again, even when you go home, I still want you to continue the four walks per day. And while you have the catheter in, which is typically for seven to 10 days after the surgery, I'd like you to keep the walks inside your home and to a flat surface. And that's just so we avoid disturbing or yanking on the catheter. Um, if you have stairs in your home, I really ask that you make your day on one level. So if you sleep upstairs, kind of come downstairs in the morning, make your day on the main level and then go back up and sleep. And again, that's to not disturb the catheter. When you're resting, I, it's also very important to avoid, until the catheter comes out, sitting at 90 degrees. So this is the one opportunity that you'd want to be like the gentleman on the right here and kind of leaning back in a recliner chair as opposed to sitting 90 degrees up. Laying perfectly flat in bed is good, but it's not ideal to be sleeping on your side or curled up. You really want to sleep flat on your back and be sitting at a recline or standing straight up and walking around. So what are you gonna do with this catheter? Because by the time you go home, you don't have any IVs anymore and you really simply just have this catheter. So I like my patients to focus on one rule and that is, is the catheter completely blocked? Because that would be the rare emergency. And in fact, that's the only thing you really have to worry about with the catheter. So how do you know if it's blocked or not? The good news is it can't be partly blocked. It's really either it's blocked or it's not. So what I would ask you to do if you have a concern is fully empty the urine bag as you'll be trained to do, and then wait one or two hours and watch to see if the bag is refilling. So long as the bag is refilling, you can be assured that it's not blocked. And the reason why I point out this rule of thumb is because there are several other things that can happen with the catheter that are okay, that are not perfectly intuitive. And one example is that you can actually leak urine from the tip of the penis around the catheter, and that's perfectly normal. That can be from a little spasm you may have due to irritation from the catheter balloon, or especially when you're bearing down to have that first bowel movement at home, you certainly may notice that urine is leaking around the catheter. And again, that's okay if the catheter is not blocked. You may also notice a tinge of blood 
uh, or drop of blood around the catheter at the tip of the penis. What we're looking for in terms of urine color is that the redness or pinkness quality of the urine is improving back to yellow over time and not worsening and becoming more bloody. If that were to happen, you should contact your doctor. And final thing I'll say about the catheter is that there's something called a leg bag, which is a smaller bag that can attach to your leg and is much smaller than the large bag that we like you to wear at nighttime because you're not getting up and going to the bathroom and we don't want any back pressure to form. If you just have the small leg bag on, it can fill up and uh, you know have no more space for the urine to come out. And so many people do like to switch between the small leg bag to be about during the day and the large bag for at night. And we are very careful to ask you to wash the connector pieces with alcohol swabs when you do that. But my personal preference, if you can manage this with your own situation, is I would just ask that you keep the one big bag on while you're recovering until the catheter comes out, if you can manage that, because that minimizes any risk of back pressure on the kidneys. There's no chance for infection to get in when you're disconnecting and reconnecting the catheter. Um, but there are some people that have a certain job or certain obligations, and so they have to use the leg bag, and that's okay too. And uh, finally, when you come to get your catheter removed, you'll have been asked to take an antibiotic in advance to prepare for that. So other concerns that might come up when you first go home and when to call. So just follow the catheter rule of thumb. Is it totally blocked? You certainly need to call. The other concerns that would come up, I want to reassure you that I feel they would be common sense and you would know if there was an issue, such as if you develop a fever, vomiting, severe pain, bleeding or pus at the incision sites, or if you go beyond that week and you still haven't had a bowel movement or gas from your bottom, then those would be reasons to call. But those seem to be much more obvious than dealing with the catheter. And for the catheter, as long as it's draining, you're in good shape. You have incisions that may be stapled or they may be glued. And so how do you take a shower? In general, once you go home, we allow you to shower, but we really ask that you let the water fall onto your back and not sort of angle the shower head onto these incisions that you would have. Um, it's very important not to do any type of soaking in the pool or hot tub until, um, you know, people will tell you different lengths four, six, eight weeks after surgery. And finally, no heavy lifting again for that same time frame. So that's what I was hoping to cover. Thank you so much. So uh, if you would return, very good. All right, that was super. Um, a totally helpful checklist, so to speak, of uh, things to expect, things to consider, and when and when and, and when to uh, hit the panic button, so to speak. Mm -hmm. uh, fortunately, there are rare, those are super rare occurrences. I mean, we've been doing support groups for over two decades and seen literally like tens of thousands of patients, probably, I don't know, 20% uh, are coming to us uh, before surgery and then come back and report their experience. They're all alive when they come back to report their experience, that's good. And, you know, they, they basically are surprised with how moderately effortless the, the whole event was, you know, it was more about anxiety and anticipation more than going through it. So um, it was good. How, how do you think it, that experience has changed just in the last five years? You know, I think that through the advent of social media and support groups like your own, I, I've noticed that the patients are very savvy and they really know a lot about what to expect and again, like I mentioned with the opiates kind of come in and, and know what to be wary of and, and how to think about how they can minimize their opiate use during their stay. And I would like to echo what you said just now, which is that I sort of laid out for those that might be more anxious and really want to know exactly what to expect, all the things that might happen. But I think it's really important to realize that as you said, most people are sort of flying through their experience. They come and have their surgery and they go home the next morning and a very smooth process. So I completely agree with that. 
Yeah, and I like that you say, you know, you're in charge of your experience, but at a point after uh, pre-op, it's about letting you do your job while the patient takes a nap and has, do you you have any uh, understanding of the kinds of dreams people have while they're uh, under surgery? Well, I always am sort of hanging around while our fine anesthesia team chats with the patient and they actually tell our patients to sort of pick a memory or pick a dream that they want to experience or a vacation that they'd want to envision. And of course, I never follow up and find out if they actually did have that dream, but I think that's a good plan to sort of come in mind with a relaxing scene or, or a thought that you might like to think about as you drift off. Right. And do they get to select, uh, ask you to put on certain music or that's really uh, for you and your team to deal with and enjoy? Yeah, I, I would say a lot of surgeons don't use m- music to make sure the team has good communication and can hear everyone. Or if they do, the music is sort of selected to make the surgeon feel very comfortable and perform at their best. Sometimes though, if there are special requests, while the patient's drifting off to sleep, we will play a song that helps the patient to feel relaxed. So that can certainly be accommodated. Yeah. Uh, so let's mm-hmm. fill in some blanks. I mean, yours was totally comprehensive, but there are also things like around people, like who are the people that a patient is going to meet and who should the patient and their families or, or friends try to make best friends of to ensure a really good quality experience? Of course. Well, I think the most important person that's going to be at your side from moment to moment is going to be your nurse. And in a lot of places, the nurses are actually specialized to urologic surgery. So they have extreme knowledge of what to look for, what's important, and what might be a good idea for you in terms of your exercises, et cetera. So really communicating with your nurse, formulating a plan. And one thing that patients don't realize is that you actually have to ask for your pain medicine in order for it to be given. And in part, that's because they don't want patients to overdose on opiates. And so they need them as a safety check to be awake enough to be able to request that that pain medicine be administered. But then sometimes if patients don't realize that, then they'll say, well, nobody ever brought me the pain medicine. So really having a good rapport and communication with your nurse will avoid miscommunications like that from happening. Um, And then you'll also, see, of course, your surgeon, your doctor, but depending on the setting where you have your surgery, whether it's in a place that has a residency program or not, um, you may also get to know the chief resident, as I've been for these past recent years, or fellow, as I am now, and we are members of the team that help and report back to the attending surgeon and see you on rounds during the day. So those people, the chief resident, the fellow, your surgeon, the nursing team are all key players um, that you would want to make sure you're aware of and get to know and have a good rapport. Yeah, and also it's just, I think, appropriate to be nice to everyone. Um, I don't know, is the phrase orderlies no longer used anywhere or is that how? Um, We don't typically do that, but there are even more members of the team I didn't touch on just now, including Besides the chief resident, there are other residents like the intern who is the first year resident. Um, In a lot of programs, um, you know, we would have the interns actually not join the full urology team until they have a full year of general surgery training or several months of general surgery training. So you may not experience a, a fresh intern, but there are also very experienced nurse practitioners and physicians assistants who are oftentimes members of the team that have more experience than even the chief residents and have been doing it for much longer. So in an academic setting or even in a private setting with PAs and nurse practitioners, you may realize that it's more of like a team sport as opposed to just there being one doctor that's in charge of you. Right. And the other side of that coin, I don't know if it's the other side, but some in the same wallet is the idea that a lot of people are coming into your room and touching you and you know, speaking to you, asking you questions. Is there a way for patients to reduce that number? I mean, 
why should a patient, I mean, does, do patients have the option to opt out of visits by interns or students or think, you know, ancillary kind of people? Um, I would say the following. So in many places where I've had experience and discussion and training, I would say that if a, a team member is coming in, it's for an important purpose. There are people um, like medical students, but we tend to have them come with us to observe and not to disturb you in a separate visit that's unnecessary. And the people that come, whether it be the intern, the chief resident, the PA, are all looking for specific information that is going to really only help you. And I think it's important to, we have a well-oiled machine and our goal is to help people get through this process as best as they possibly can. And it's really important to try to keep that in Intact. And it makes me concerned. I'll share with you a personal anecdote. So during my residency, both my father and my father-in-law were diagnosed with prostate cancer and they both had surgery. And so for me, it was really important to make sure that, you know, just because I was a team member and people knew who I was, that you don't want any special changes and you don't want to sort of rock the boat because what we do and our well-oiled machine is designed to give you the best results. So I would be just cautioned to be careful about trying to individualize the process that's working so well. Yeah. And, you know, uh, just before I forget, one of our better suggestions that have evolved in our network throughout the country uh, is a dozen donuts, you know, like to leave like a dozen donuts at the nursing station, you know, or at the reception desk or whatever. Um, not so much as a bribe, but just as a preemptive thank you kind of thing, you know, to show that you appreciate the work that people uh, without MDs are doing for your care. And every patient that's done that, everybody that's come back has said that was really good because somebody said thank you and that made them feel good while they were laying in the hospital bed. You know, it's good for patients to hear like, thank you for being here as a patient. Uh, thank you for the honor of letting me care for you. You know, and, and you know, to have, you know, to have that interaction with uh, healthcare professionals is very, very gratifying for everybody, I think. Would you agree? I, yeah. I think that is a completely nice and super thoughtful gesture. But as a surgeon, I would think to myself, I don't want my patient to think that he has to be burdened with arranging that when he's dealing with such a huge moment in his mm -hmm. life. And I would hope and could vouch for that someone that does bring donuts or doesn't bring donuts is still going to get the same care. So I don't want anybody to feel like that would be necessary or required for them to have their best experience. And of course, it's been so kind and so nice when people do do that. But I want you to focus on the extreme challenge that you're going through right now and not have to worry about bringing a present or arranging for donuts. So that would be my take on it. No, and it's uh, totally appropriate. I mean, well said uh, and well taken. Um, uh, I mean, I, I'm just hearing like a dozen patients talking about their dozen donut experiences and you know, say, oh, that's well, we do lot. like donuts. Yeah. I will donuts say that. Cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, Patients also have the opportunity to uh, to uh, tell a visitor to decide who visits or not, mm -hmm. and that's a relatively new thing. Mail care was instrumental in getting that uh, uh, stipulation or regulation passed uh, during the Obama administration through uh, the HHS. Uh, it's, I think it was HHS, uh, CMS, um, you know, so that CMS hospitals, uh, patients are in charge of who visits, no longer the hospitals. Um, and, and I mean, do you find that a crit, uh, an important consideration for some of your patients? Absolutely. I find that, you know, having that support person there, um, whoever it may be, a spouse, a friend, a child, um, to be there during the nurse training to watch the care video with you is incredibly important. And it's been so unfortunate that this has been limited recently during coronavirus. And for example, at the National Institutes of Health, we have been making allowances for 
a family member to be able to be present during training, essential discharge training uh, for that patient. So that's been something that's been a new challenge during these times, but in general, I think is incredibly important to have a support person with you. Yeah, what, what are the things patients can do around just, you know, ta tactile care? Can they bring their own bed sheets, their own pillows, uh, you know, pajamas, things like that? I guess I would preface everything with things are different now during the coronavirus, but, you know, just, I really hope that we surmount this obstacle. So I'll just speak in general, you know, into the future. Um, I think it would be fabulous to bring your own robe, your own slippers, your own pillow, if that makes you more comfortable, your own pillowcase. Um, I think all of those options are possible. I think what people don't anticipate is some of the little minor leaks and the tubes and that might happen where you don't want to ruin your best clothes. So a man might find himself most comfortable in the hospital gown, but additional comfort measures such as a robe and slippers, I think, and please bring your own blanket, especially if you get cold because the hospital blankets are not very warm. We can give you additional ones, but I think that's a key piece of comfort that many patients bring their own blanket and really enjoy that experience. Yeah, and perhaps eye shades too, because lights are on in the hallway at the very least. And often if you have a roommate, they pop on unexpectedly. Exactly. And some certain places, and this is something you might inquire about, but certain places only use single rooms. Um, you know, so you don't have a roommate and some places make an emphasis on, you know, being quiet and calm in the hours of the evening so that you can get your rest. So those are all very important key things to potentially investigate when you choose uh, where you're going to have your surgery. Yeah. Uh, we, I don't think we meant, you mentioned or we, we talked about um, just how many days is somebody in the hospital and how do you figure out longer or shorter periods of time? So overwhelmingly 90 plus percent of people are going to be discharged to home on the first day after surgery. And sometimes that's in the morning time, but more commonly that's in the afternoon or evening time. Rarely someone will have to stay for a second night, but that would be if they didn't meet one of the benchmarks that we were looking for medically. And I find that many patients are concerned about leaving on that first afternoon and day, and we never want anyone to be uncomfortable, but there are risks of staying in the hospital when it's not necessary, such as, you know, getting an infection with one of the superbugs that are floating around the hospital, getting Clostridium difficile and having infectious diarrhea, etc. So I think that just popularizing the knowledge that being discharged on the first day is what to expect and what we're going to get you ready for, but not to feel rushed out or kicked out ever if there's a concern. We would rather have you to stay um, and have our eyes on you until you feel comfortable to go. But if you come in with that knowledge and that expectation, I think that helps to facilitate your discharge on the first day, which is expected. Yeah, and really super that you mentioned walking uh, multiple times. Uh, we have a program in beta now, I mean, maybe by early 2021, it'll be ready for everyone. Uh, it's called 30 Minutes to Live, and it's about spending 30 minutes a day, five or six days a week walking anywhere you know, up and down your hallway, you know, while you're doing laundry, talking to yourself if you feel like it, you know, just to get the body moving. And, you know, not to sound vulgar, but to give permission to belch and to expel gases orally and anally, um, because walking, you know, as we get older, we sort of retain a lot of the gases from foods we eat and liquids we drink and just general intake. And it's, better to have those expelled and walking helps that. Um, so good that you mentioned walking um, and perhaps we'll add a piece to that program around post-surgical care. Uh, the idea of, um, oh, what just happened here? You could still see me, correct? Yes, yes. Ah, all right, I'm going to assume that we can, yeah. 
something just disappeared. My bandwidth is no better than the NIH's. <laughs> so, so the idea of um, uh, discharge is, is in the doctor's hands, but a patient, you know, it's not for the patient to plead or let me stay another day. It's actually better to be at home for recovery, as you just said. Yeah, I would say that. And But the other thing to know, and I hope this never happens to you, but especially um, uh, in, if you have Medicare, you in, in some circumstances have a right not to be discharged. And, and hospitals don't want to push people out against their will. Doctors don't want to push people out against their will. But the general thought as, you know, as you said, before sitting here over a coffee shop, as I wish we could be, and, and you were my, uh, you know, close friend I was advising about this is that you should try to get yourself home by the first day and by doing your best on all these exercises and walking. And if something's going awry, that's going to prevent that, uh, your doctors will notice that and, and make a plan with you to stay another night. Yeah. What, what are considerations that are just you know, one in a thousand patients might experience. Sure. So let me talk to you about uh, a common complication that can very rarely occur, like you said, but something to sort of wrap your mind around. And this is something that's called a lymphocele or lymph leak. So this really depends on the risk of your prostate cancer, whether or not you will have a lymph node dissection during your surgery. Um, if you have low risk prostate cancer, oftentimes you will not have a lymph node dissection because the chance that the cancer has spread out to the lymph nodes is too low to justify the potential risks such as the lymphocele that I'm gonna be discussing. Um, other people, you know, very high Gleason 8, 9, 10 prostate cancer will have potentially an extended lymph node dissection in a wider area. And especially in these cases, there's a greater chance of a lymphocele. So, if we went ahead and for whatever reason took CT scan of everybody after their prostate surgery, men that were at home feeling well, doing well. In fact, a lot of them would probably have small lymphocele's, which is collection of lymph fluid in the pelvis kind of on either side of the bladder where we find the lymph nodes. But the problem comes when somebody has a larger or symptomatic lymphocele that can cause fever, it can compress the bladder, causing urination issues, it can cause leg swelling, it can put pressure on the veins to the leg and cause a blood clot. But the great and fortunate thing is that even with this complication, the fix for it or the treatment for it um, ultimately is largely successful and minimal. So what you would likely need if this were to happen to you would be a drain placement uh, similar to the surgical drain if you had one, but it gets placed not through a surgical procedure, but in what we call interventional radiology. So these are radiologists, the people that provide reports for CAT scans, MRI scans that have special training in under image guidance, doing small procedures such as this, which would be a placement of a drain into the lymph collection. And then once that small drain was placed, you would likely be again tasked with keeping a diary of how much is coming out. And you may have to keep that drain in for a week or several days. And, um, and hopefully it will drain out and dry up on its own. Um, if not, you may have to have what's called a sclerosis where medication is, is placed through the drain to sort of dry up the lymph leaking, et cetera. So that's one of the rare but common among the rare issues that may come up and what you might face if that happens to you. So not a permanent issue, but certainly an annoyance of an issue while you're going through it. Yeah, and I asked to illustrate that there's a solution for everything, you know, and perhaps more so now than 20 years ago, that people should feel confident that whatever idiosyncratic problem pops up, somebody knows how to fix that you know, or, or at least engage somebody somewhere else to come and fix it for them, you know, and, Certainly. and yeah, in the last few minutes we have in this really useful conversation, there are patients, I mean, we're an organization that has an international profile now, and there'll be people watching from developed and lesser developed countries. 
there are also people in the United States and Europe and Canada that live in rural areas where they're, they're using, you know, community centers, you know, small scale hospitals with 40 or 50 beds, uh, one urologist for a thousand miles, perhaps, you know, situations like that. Can you sort of give confidence or, or just truth to the idea that the hospital settings are more or less in, within developed countries, more or less on par with each other, no matter what setting the, the, they're placed? Um, I don't know that I can go so far as to say that they're all equal, but what I will say certainly is that the advent of robotic prostatectomy has taken an incredibly difficult procedure that only the most skilled people could do and made it accessible for the majority, if not all trainees to be able to master and do well at. And there's a couple of reasons for that. Number one is it puts you right at the action. There's a huge level of magnification so we can zoom in and see what's going on. And it allows you to turn your wrist to do the hardest part of the surgery, which is to sew the bladder back to the urethra. And the fact that this can now be assisted by the robot means that you don't have to go to the world's expert to have your prostate surgery done well. It's something that many people can train well and disseminate the knowledge and, and be able to do very competently. And the other thing is that since prostatectomy is more now of a minor surgery, you don't need an ICU stay, you're on a regular floor. And there's even been some discussions that in the future, this is something that could potentially be done as an outpatient surgery, even in the morning at a surgery center. So, so, so this is certainly something that you would feel more confident going into at a rural setting than uh, perhaps a more difficult or complicated surgery. Yeah. Does the future hold that the robot could be used remotely? You know, uh, perhaps in a country without really good trained surgeons and good facilities that uh, a doctor in Baltimore could operate on somebody, you know, in, in um, Guinea Bissau, perhaps. I think with the technology that we have, that's definitely possible to have someone at the console and a robot somewhere else, an internet connection. But the problem is, what do you do when the connection breaks down or there's an issue and somebody has to be right at the bedside? And so you can make arrangements for that, um, you know, with, with specialized people. Um, but I think uh, the robot is very exciting in that it leaves that possibility open, but I don't think that we're there yet for the reasons that I mentioned. Yeah. So this has been extraordinary. Uh, in one compact, less than an hour presentation, I think whoever's watching now has a bit more confidence about uh, the success of their hospital stay and the comfort that will be provided and the assurance of good quality care. And the follow-up uh, takes them home and for their body to help with their recovery. So thank you very much, Dr. Chalfin. This has been super. Um, our audience, I'm sure, thanks you too. Um, if you could imagine applause, please do. Um, and we will be sending you donuts at some point. So. Oh, thank you so much. And I, I really want to echo and stress that, that I've pointed these things out that you can do anywhere in any hospital system, because these are simple exercises that you can do to help ensure your own good recovery. And thank you so much for having me. It's been really my pleasure. And welcome to the conference. Thank, thank you. you. Mm -hmm.